Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I'm, I'm a PhD candidate here at Erasmus University at the Media and Communication um, Institute. Uh, and I'm also at the same time a lecturer within the International Bachelor of Communication and Media. Now, doing these two things means that my working life is really characterized by two kind of main activities, um, teaching and working on my dissertation. Now, in teaching, I, I predominantly, not exclusively, but predominantly teach a lot of statistics and research methods. So that activity uh, looks a lot like, like that, standing in front of a classroom and you know, torturing students with formulas. The other activity is much less of a social activity, it's much more of a, of a solitary activity, um, which involves a lot of me staring at this, uh, torturing myself. So these are the two things that I really spend kind of my, my yeah, my, my working hours on, um, teaching and working on my dissertation. Now, despite the fact that this is kind of, this is kind of my day job that I spend, you know, 90% of my time on, uh, I've also started doing other stuff in the last couple of years. And um, the fact that I started doing other stuff has led to um, very different situations and very different places that I've found myself in in the last couple of years such as this one. This is me standing um, at a marketplace in, in Togo, right next to the border to Ghana, trying to look tough, but also trying to fit in at the same time, and failing spectacularly on both accounts, obviously. Um, I was there working on a, on a, on a World Bank project uh, on data gathering. Now, how did that happen? How did I you know, move from the left to the right? How did I stumble across that line in the middle? In order to answer that question, I need to take you back a couple of years, and I need to take you back uh, to this place in Amsterdam. Um, and I, I need to take you back to a night out with a couple of friends. Um, now, I was at the time working at the University of Amsterdam, and we were you know, having uh, drinks, and for some reason I wasn't very happy with my job. Um, so I started complaining, I went on this rant of how I wanted to do something out of, uh, outside of university, and I so desperately wanted to see whether any of these skills and this knowledge that I had acquired within academia would actually be of any value outside of academia. Because so far I'd only applied it within the, uh, the confinement of the university. Now the person who was kind of unlucky enough to sit next to me during my rant and who had to listen to all of that uh, was a friend of mine who uh, works in international development. And probably just to shut me up, uh, she told me about this project, about this organization that they were partnering with in Tanzania uh, that was doing some kind of research project in the city of Dar es Salaam, uh, which is the biggest city in Tanzania. Now, um, she also told me that uh, they would probably not be able to offer me any money if I would decide to go there, but maybe you know, we could work out some kind of um, unpaid internship, something like that. Now, this was a time in my life uh, where I thought that I had left the times of unpaid internships you know, well behind me, um, you know, having a steady job and feeling all kind of grown up. Um, but, uh, well, and at the same time, also, I didn't know the first thing about Africa. I'd never been to Africa, didn't know anything about Tanzania. Um, so that's one side. On the other hand, I was also slightly drunk, um, and, <laughs> and I also really liked the way that Dar es Salaam kind of rolled off my tongue. And it rolls even better when you had like two, three beers. It's, it's beautiful. So I said yes, and I decided to, to, um, to go. So a couple of months later, I found myself in this exciting and fascinating and crazy and diverse place uh, called Dar es Salaam. Uh, the organization that I was going to work for, as I soon found out, uh, was trying to do something very new. What they were trying to do is um, trying to gather data, high quality, high frequency data, about what people think, what they do, and the problems that they're facing in their everyday lives uh, in Dar es Salaam. Now, the technology that they were going to use for this uh, was mobile phone technology. And up until the point that I actually went there, I had a very kind of vague and simplistic idea of the success story of mobile phone technology. Um, I want to uh, draw your attention to this graph. This graph will take us through time, make us travel through time up until the present moment, more or less, um, on different ICT indicators. And I want you to pay attention to the upper three ones. The upper, the, the, the upper one is uh, mobile phone rising there. You can see now internet taking over, kind of beating the landlines, landlines steadily declining, internet steadily declining, and mobile phone kind of shooting through the roof. Now, this is a very simple story, right? When we look at this, uh, this looks like a very clear-cut, simple story. 
Um, however, whenever a graph tells us a simple story, uh, this is the point where we should you know, start getting suspicious. Because whenever we look at graphs like these, we have to remember that they are based on statistics, and these are really not much more than just you know, efforts to quantify a world that is essentially a messy place. Uh, and I think this thought is so beautifully captured um, in this quote, namely that statistics really are like bikinis. What they reveal is suggestive, but what they conceal is vital. <laughs> and, and I think this is so true. And you know, apart from the fact that obviously this is just a brilliant, brilliant uh, and, and uh, funny quote, it's, also, it's, 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 it's exactly that. Now, when we apply this, uh, so this idea of the bikini, when we apply this to uh, our issue at hand, uh, what this draws our attention to really is the fact that these developments, of course, didn't take place uniformly all across the world uh, at the same time. Uh, but, you know, things happen differently in different regions. And you might be um, excused for, for thinking that this is mainly a Western development happening in what we call the Western world. Now, for that, I would like to draw your attention to this graph. Now, this is the total amount of SIM cards, active mobile phone subscriptions worldwide, divided up by this admittedly very problematic distinction, developed world, developing world. Now, this is the situation in the year 2000. This was the situation in 2005. And this is an estimate of what the situation was last year. Now, we could now continue to deconstruct and criticize this graph as well, but what this graph shows us quite indisputably is that here we have a technology that, for the first time, manages to touch the lives of millions of people, some of them in the poorest parts of the world, um, that had never had access to any form of electronic or digital um, communication. And not just people using these, uh, this new form of communication, mobile phone technology, but also people uh, using it in creative ways and appropriating it in ways that make sense to their everyday lives. Because people living in these parts of the world uh, obviously are also among the most resilient and the most creative people uh, that you will find. In a country like Tanzania, this, for example, means that um, while only 1% have a landline uh, phone and about 5% use the internet, more than 60% of households actually own a mobile phone. So this is really a medium uh, that matters. Now, this development hasn't gone unnoticed in the field of international development. Um, actually, there is now a, a true hype, a true euphoria in this field of international development of how to use mobile phones uh, for development aims. And I think this, this euphoria is expressed really very nicely in this uh, infographics put out by the, the US uh, aid agency, USAID, uh, that talks about uh, mobile phones um, uh, empowering the poor. And it talks about how mobile phones uh, can deliver education, keep people healthy, uh, strengthen democracy, improve transparency, root out corruption. So when you see this, you get a sense of, like, this is just going to fix it, right? I mean, this technology is just going to fix the world. Um, and obviously, as you can tell already, I have a bit of an issue with these kind of narratives. My issue is not that I don't believe that, you know, specific aims here can be achieved with the help of this technology, but my issue is that this narrative kind of implies that there's something inherently good in this piece of technology that will inherently and, and inevitably lead to processes of democratization and um, um, decreasing poverty. And I don't think that's, that's true. That's a utopian view of a technological determinism. Hasn't been true, has never been true with any piece of technology. What I do believe is what it's worth doing is looking at very specific uses of technology, in this case mobile phone technology, and looking at how we can use the technology for development aims, and then see whether that works in very specific cultural, social, political, and economic contexts. And that's what I've been trying to do um, with uh, my work that I've, that I've uh, been doing outside of academia in the last couple of weeks, uh, last couple of years, using mobile phone technology for um, data gathering. Now, when I do this kind of work and when I travel to, to, to some country in Africa and I speak to someone here and they ask, so, oh, you're going to Africa now, interesting, what do you do there? And I tell them about this. Then the, the, what some people, I think, their, their, their gut reaction, even they, they might be too polite to say it, but their gut, gut reaction, I feel, often is, really? Like, Data? Is that, you know, should we worry about data? Uh, in a country like Malawi or Tanzania, shouldn't we spend that money on healthcare and on, on, on education and, and reforming institutions and so forth? But I think what we tend to forget in this data saturated environment that we live in here is that data matter. Uh, data are not inconsequential, data matter, uh, and especially 
highly reliable and timely data about what people do, what they want, uh, and what they think matters a great deal. And it matters to an awful lot of different societal actors and for an awful lot of reasons. It matters to policymakers to know where to take their country, to know what works and what doesn't work in terms of policy. It matters a great deal to uh, humanitarian organizations to evaluate and monitor their projects on the ground. And, and this is kind of the po point that I'm stressing, it matters a great deal for citizens to push for institutional transparency and to hold their leaders accountable um, for what they're doing. Now, um, in Dar es Salaam, uh, what, we, uh, what we did or what we are doing there, and this, what we did there, what we started there, was really a pilot and has been now uh, kind of uh, done in a couple of other African countries as well. Uh, what we did here is we uh, went into people's homes and we did interviews with people. Um, these are face-to-face, one-on-one -face, uh, interviews. Uh, at least th they are supposed to be one-on-one -on -one interviews. It turned out that when we come there with our whole entourage, and especially when I'm kind of with them, um, uh, and we sit down in people's living rooms, then this is kind of an exciting event. And before you know it, the whole living room is filled up with a whole neighborhood, and we end up <laughs> having one big focus group discussion. Uh, <laughs> But, right, I mean, that's the reality, then that's just what's it going to be. So that's a reality you have to live with. Um, at the end of these interviews, we then ask people whether they're willing to uh, participate in the mobile phone survey. And if they do, they will get called uh, once a month. Um, and they will get a small credit top-up uh, transfer to their phones, right? Remotely transfer to their phones as an incentive um, to stay in the panel. Now, to give you an idea of the type of things that we, that we, the type of data that we are gathering, we are, in principle, we are asking different questions um, each month, but there are a couple of themes that, that, that are reoccurring that we kind of focus on regularly. And one of them is education. Now, education is a hugely important topic, and we know an awful lot about education in Tanzania. And, for example, we know that the problem with education in Tanzania is certainly not enrollment. Uh, it's not that students don't go to school. They do. Like, the, 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 the large majority of children in school age go to school in Tanzania. The problem is much more with what happens at school, what doesn't happen at school. And part of that problem is that teachers often don't turn up. They just don't, they don't just turn up. And this has, you know, this has a number of reasons. And, um, but what we were interested in is seeing how big is this problem actually, because up until that point, we only had anecdotal evidence about this. Uh, we knew this is a problem, and there were some uh, numbers on this, but very unreliable and very indirect measurements. So what we did is we called those households that we knew had children uh, of school age, and we asked the children directly, yesterday, was your teacher at school, yes or no? So for the first time for Dar es Salaam, we were able to really put a figure to this problem and say, you know, this is how often this happens and this can't, uh, this, this should be uh, fixed. Uh, and of course, this then gets picked up, picked up by the national media um, and feeds into public discussion. Another theme that is a reoccurring theme is nutrition and, and, and food security. Now, since we have a panel, we can measure changes across time. So, for example, when food prices went up, we were able to see what that does to consumption patterns, how people kind of still manage to feed their families, and, of course, the problematic aspects of these. And this then also, again, gets picked up by the national media and feeds into public discussion. Now, what we also regularly ask people is what they think their political leaders should be spending their time and money on. So what should be the top priorities um, for the government and especially for the local government? Now, uh, access to public services, water, electricity is always way up there on the list. Um, so we regularly do rounds on access to clean water and access to electricity and the number of power cuts you had in the last week, which is a huge problem in the city and so forth. And these reports that we put out also have generated quite a lot of public discussion, partly because the numbers that we put out didn't always match the official numbers that were already there. Uh, and in one case, actually, this has meant that the, the managing director of the electricity company felt the need to explain himself of why this is, that our numbers didn't quite match the official numbers that they were using. Now, as I said, there are a number of other projects that do similar things, and I'm involved in, in some of them. Uh, one that I'm not directly involved in, um, but I think a very interesting one, um, is a project uh, that is done by the World Food Program um, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in, in eastern Congo, Kivu, just outside of the city of Goma that you might have heard of. Um, this is a, a, an IDP camp, um, and uh, what they're doing there is also handing out phones and building up a panel and asking about food security um, 
and vulnerability. Now, this is a very, very difficult um, context for a survey researcher. Like, if you want to do survey research, this is one of the hardest places you can do survey in a, in a um, place for, um, well, re in a refugee camp. Um, if, uh, so, uh, what this shows is that this technique for gathering data uh, can be used in situations that previously were so hard to research and uh, so hard to, to approach. In this case, also, you had to deal with the fact that electricity is a problem. So what they did is they had these large solar panels that you can see there, and they gave them to a local committee um, and they were able to generate some profit, building a little bit, a little business out of that, but at the same time allowing those people who are in the panel to charge their phones uh, for free. Now, since this is a, a TEDx talk, um, I, I thought I'd I end with kind of a, what are the, the take-home lessons, right? The lessons learned, what can we take, take away from this uh, PowerPoint with like three bullet points. So I have prepared three bullet points of lessons learned. Uh, the first one uh, is that really make sure you don't get carried away by technology when you think about the way to use technology for development. Just because you and your well-meaning friends sitting in some cafe in Rotterdam are really excited about some new technology doesn't mean that it'll be relevant or effective or meaningful at all um, in those contexts. The second point is um, we have to rethink the way we think about data, I think. Uh, not as something dull, as something inconsequential, but as a, as a tool for social change. Data as something exciting. Uh, data that can actually bring about change. And the last point, and I think it's the most obvious point of my talk, but I thought I'd still put it uh, on that slide, uh, is of course is that when you get asked over a couple of beers to go to a place with the names that rolls off your tongue nicely, you should totally go. <laughs> Thank you very much.